Welcome to the Cutting Edge Health Podcast with Jane Rogers, where we discuss science to help prevent cognitive decline. A world-renowned neuroscientist is my guest in this episode of the Cutting Edge Health Preventing Cognitive Decline podcast. Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Lima researches brain energy, learning, and memory in his lab at the University of Texas, Austin. He is a professor in the departments of psychology, pharmacology, and toxicology, and psychiatry, plus the Institute for Neuroscience there. Born in Cuba, his father was a veterinarian. Francisco has worked alongside Nobel Prize winners, has given 120 lectures around the world, and contributed to more than 400 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals. He's an expert in an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase, which he's discovered is inhibited in the post-mortem Alzheimer's brains that he studied. But in this discussion, he lists three interventions that can reverse this cytochrome oxidase inhibition and restore oxygen levels in the brain, providing the energy the brain needs to thrive. Dr. Gonzalez Lima, thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in being really one of the top um, neuroscientists in the world. What, what led you on this path? What compels you to do this work day in and day out? Uh, well, I had a lot of inspiration, actually. Uh, my uh, professors uh, were a big influence. Uh, even before I came to the U.S., uh, I admired uh, very much uh, some of my uh, father's uh, colleagues uh, that were veterinarians and uh, were doing uh, uh, interesting studies uh, with animals. And uh, then at uh, Tulane University, I had a wonderful uh, professor, uh, Dr. Joanne King, who dissected a human brain in front of us uh, in the class. And uh, seeing this experience and her teachings were very important for me to get motivated to study the brain. And uh, then I had a wonderful experience during that summer after I finished uh, most of my studies working in a research lab as part of my uh, honors thesis research. And that lab was uh, really fantastic. And the lab itself, the principal investigator, Dr. Uh, Shally, was able to uh, uh, win the Nobel Prize uh, during that uh, winter uh, after that uh, experience. So it was wow. a place where discovery was uh, a wonderful thing. And then you decided that you wanted to really focus on the human brain and how it relates to behavior. And specifically, what we're going to talk about today is Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's prevention. And I've heard you say that nine out of 10 cases of Alzheimer's, there's no inheritance or familial tie. Can you explain that? Because a lot of people think, oh, it runs in my family. Yes, uh, uh, this is a big uh, misconception. Uh, the overwhelming uh, number of cases uh, are not related to hereditary factors. It is very rare to have uh, what is also called Alzheimer's disease due to a hereditary factor. And uh, you're going to hear otherwise, uh, unfortunately, but uh, there is a little bit of a misconception in the field that what happens to people early on, like for example in the 50s, if they become demented, those rare cases in the 50s, their 40s, they are also referred to as Alzheimer's disease. And in those cases, yes, there are genetic and hereditary factors involved. But in what happens late in life, the so-called late onset Alzheimer's, when people are in their uh, way up over their 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth, this is uh, not what happens uh, in the younger people. 
this is a cognitive aging process that leads uh, to dementia. In the past, this used to be called uh, senile dementia, but then it was replaced by the Alzheimer's. Many diseases uh, in, in medicine has now changed their names to have the name of an uh, individual, usually a, a doctor. And uh, in science, we've done the opposite. Uh, uh, we have changed the names of uh, scientists uh, and use more descriptive terms so that it's clear what, what is meant. For example, uh, Alzheimer's uh, used to be called senile dementia. Uh, Down syndrome uh, used to be called, be called trisomy of 21 for the uh, hmm. chromosome 21 having three. And uh, so really what happens is the major predisposing factor, so-called risk factor for dementia in all age is your age. How old are you? The older you are, the more likely that you're gonna have uh, dementia. I like to refer to it as uh, geriatric dementia, just dementia happening in older people. But people should not be afraid that they are going to inherit this because uh, one or two of their parents, are, when they are old, are showing signs of dementia. There is no such thing as a hereditary old age Alzheimer's disease. This is a big misconception. And that's where we've gone off on this path, saying it's amyloid, it's amyloid. And you're saying, yes. no, 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 how did you put it? You said, um, this is the largest failure of the biomedical research enterprise in the world during your lifetime. Yes, because of the focus on amyloid and the erroneous idea that this is what is causing the disease in the older people, there have been decades of research and all of them have resulted in a failure. In other words, uh, there have been not millions, but literally billions of dollars invested in research by every major pharmaceutical company in the world with the so-called amyloid hypothesis. And every single trial that have been done with real humans, not just uh, models, have resulted in a failure. And uh, the reason for this is that amyloid uh, doesn't cause Alzheimer's disease in the old age. If you remove the amyloid from the brain, this doesn't benefit uh, anybody. Uh, you are still demented if you were demented you're not going to get better. And in fact, uh, every possible drug that has been tried not only has failed to produce benefit, but they have produced uh, adverse uh, consequences. So all this information is um, heartening for someone like myself, whose parents both have Alzheimer's. My dad passed from it. My mom's in memory care now. And I have the APOE4 gene, heterozygous. And I was thinking I was headed down that road, but they both got it in their older age. Um, mm -hmm. My dad, not so much. He was early 60s, but my mom, definitely. And so what you're saying is for folks like us, this started mm -hmm. decades before. It's not amyloid. It's something that we really, if we try, can get a handle on mm -hmm. and reverse the trajectory so we won't get what was called senile dementia. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and that's the approach. What There has to be a transformation in the thinking, moving away from what, what are referred to as a biomarkers of disease mm -hmm. that are part of a disease model of cognitive aging, and moving to what I refer to as a modifiable risk factors, factors that we know can be modified that will prevent your cognitive decline as you grow old. And this is possible to do. Uh, of course, the only 
bridge factor, you cannot modify is your age. But every other factor that is modifiable, you can do with lifestyle changes and you can immediately reduce your risk for developing dementia as you grow old. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things is uh, what we're doing here today. Your, your audience is uh, learning, is becoming engaged uh, in an intellectual conversation. So this is what the brain thrives on. Uh, the more we engage in cognitive tasks, tasks that require our thinking, especially our critical thinking, like right now we're looking at the uh, contrast of what is being a fail hypotheses versus trying to transform into moving to modifiable risk factors. This is a kind of a conversation that is going to be beneficial for your brain. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So before we talk about interventions, and I'm very excited about the interventions that your lab at Austin are showing have some efficacy. But before we get to that, how should someone even determine if they have possible very early stage Alzheimer's or is it just a senior moment? What's going to go mm -hmm. first? Short term memory, right? Yes, uh, it is a progression. Uh, you can think of it as a first uh, short term memory. The most, uh, then you will move. If you think of a time uh, frame, First, you have the most immediate shorter term memories. Then you have the more recent memories. And then you have the more remote memories. That uh, time refers from when the event took place to when you're trying to do the recollection. So the beginning is uh, these uh, shorter times. So you have an event and then uh, soon, soon after you have difficulty recalling that event. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. when dementia takes place, then the recent memory is going to become affected. And if your brain is experiencing degeneration, uh, then the remote memories uh, are going to be affected. However, uh, everyone, as we grow older, we're going to have difficulties following the same trajectory. The first uh, problems that we're going to have as uh, we grow older is that sometimes we cannot retrieve information uh, that we already know, but also that we cannot encode uh, new information that we can retrieve uh, soon after. And that's a normal forgetting that happens as part of cognitive aging. It's typical of cognitive aging, different individuals depending on all the, how they modify the other risk factors, can manipulate that. But everyone, as compared to you at a younger age, you're going to have some degree of cognitive decline due to aging. And that is not Alzheimer's disease. And trying to treat that with any of the medications that exist for Alzheimer's disease right now or the ones that we're uh, trying to develop for uh, the amyloid will only make it worse. There is evidence more than a decade of uh, research showing that if you have uh, cognitive aging or mild cognitive decline or mild early uh, dementia, if you take the medications that are prescribed and actually approved only for Alzheimer's disease, usually for moderate to severe, if you start taking them earlier, you're going to decline faster in terms of cognitive aging. And not only are you going to decline faster, you're also going to die sooner. And the data there, and of course, some people uh, go into depression when they're told that, that they are, well, you have Alzheimer's that's starting out. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not the case. The majority of people uh, do not have Alzheimer's disease when they grow old. Uh, this is not true. Uh, but we do have a cognitive decline. 
and there are modifiable risk factors that we can work on. Uh, we have mentioned the one that have to do with the cognitive uh, stimulation. The cognitive stimulation can be done with intellectual material. We can also, uh, there are other modifiable risk factors like uh, social stimulation. Being able to interact with uh, other people in social context will also uh, lower your risk for Alzheimer's. The other factors that, that, that have to do with your uh, rest, like sleep hygiene, many people as uh, uh, they grow older uh, they may experience problems uh, with sleep and uh, sometimes uh, sleep apnea where they stop uh, breathing during the sleep and i would say the most important ones of the biological risk factors that can be modified is uh, generally in the category of uh, cardiometabolic and of those, the most likely to be modified uh, with success is midlife obesity. Midlife obesity will result in an acceleration of cognitive decline. It will result in uh, cardiovascular impairments. It will result in uh, diabetes. And it will also produce a state of uh, excessive lipids that will affect some of the hormonal balances that we have normally in the body. So, and as you know, now in the US, uh, uh, the last uh, official number I uh, researched was uh, 40, over 42% of uh, the population uh, can be classified as obese. And the critical period is, uh, of that obesity is uh, during midlife. So you have to prevent that from happening in midlife. If you, for example, already are old and went through midlife with obesity, there is unlikely that you're going to benefit uh, at that point to prevent this uh, accelerated cognitive decline. Obesity can go hand in hand with blood pressure. And what do you think the correct blood pressure should be now? It's been revised, right? Down. You don't have to try to pin down a number because there is a lot of individual variants. The more uh, physically fit that you are, the lower will be your blood pressure. So it is, uh, you know, what happens with blood pressure is, as uh, we grow older uh, and this process starts out uh, starts out when we are uh, in midlife, we have an autoregulatory process. That is, when the heart pumps, if our arteries are no longer as elastic as they need to be to allow the blood to go through, uh, this results in an increase in the blood pressure. So what the heart does is it works harder to, in order to try to get that blood uh, throughout the body, especially to the head. The head consumes around one third to one fourth of the blood that is pumped every time the heart pumps blood uh, as the, the organ that has the major uh, blood consumption for oxygen. Uh, consumption. So this autoregulatory process is something that the body is doing to allow you to continue. The problem is that you, when you reach a level where the pressure can no longer uh, compensate for the hardening of the arteries. And sometimes it's not just the elasticity the thickness of the walls of the arteries, but also the the lumen, the hole where the uh, blood uh, needs to go through the blood vessels, uh, that becomes narrower. And in fact, if you do experiments uh, in midlife, uh, just measuring the thickness of the wall of your carotid arteries in the neck, and I have I have done that with uh, colleagues uh, here at the University of Texas, 
it entirely uh, serves as a predictor of your cognitive performance. The thicker the walls of your carotid arteries, the lower your cognitive performance. And you can use that also as a risk factor for uh, dementia in old age. Oh, that's fascinating. So that's done with an ultrasound, right? With an ultrasound, completely non-invasive. Uh, and it's something that uh, this decanosine is much more informative than just the blood pressure. Uh, because uh, especially for, for the brain, because through uh, essentially the majority of the blood supply that gets uh, into your brain has to go through that uh, carotid artery in the neck. We have a minor contribution through the back that are called the vertebral arteries, but uh, this is the major uh, supplier. And then you can look at uh, both sides and it is a really linear correlation between the wall's thickness uh, and your cognitive performance. Unfortunately, the common ultrasound that is done uh, for clinical purposes, it has a very high threshold and it doesn't really look at the thickness. What they look is at the looming, at that hole. Uh, how big is the the hole going through and then they have very high threshold like the percent occlusion before they say yes you have a carotid disease but uh, what i'm talking about is before you have reached that threshold where you have a small amount of uh, cavity open for the blood to go through it is already making an impact. And you can modify that uh, through aerobic uh, exercise. And uh, as soon as uh, you detect something like this, it is reversible. It is not uh, something that is, is gonna be there. You can reverse uh, the elasticity to a certain degree the, because all of these tissues are constantly in an exchange. The problem with the brain is that uh, we don't have that kind of a uh, re renewal that we have for cells that make up all the tissues, especially in the case of neurons. There are only a few sections of where new neurons can be born. So basically we're operating with the same neurons that we were born for the most part and that's really what determines how long you're gonna live. In other words, the only uh, cell types that are keeping your entire life histories are your neurons. All the cell types, they change and they're replaced by new ones. So this is uh, a, then a very close relationship between lifespan, aging, and brain function. And this is uh, why you need to do things that will uh, protect neurons uh, from becoming impaired. And exercise is one of those, and diet's one of them, and watching your blood pressure and mm -hmm, sleep. And I emphasize the aerobic part mm -hmm. because uh, you need to oxygenate uh, the blood so it can reach the brain, oxygenate the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, sleep uh, hygiene is important so that you don't have episodes where your brain is deprived of uh, ox oxygen while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And uh, focusing on your cardiovascular system to prevent uh, having any problem with your blood flow and your heart pumping ability, that's where the effort should be invested. So it is uh, ir ironical, but uh, the best thing that you can do for your brain is to take care of your cardiovascular system. <laughs> the heart-brain connection. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Speaking of oxygen to the brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, oxygen to the brain is uh, fundamental. However, the problem is that 
there is a uh, damage to other mechanisms that cannot use the oxygen to obtain energy. So first you have to have the oxygen being able to get to the brain, but then you have to be able to have uh, the brain tissue capable of using the oxygen to generate energy. And this is uh, where the mitochondria play that fundamental role. So the, inside the mitochondria is where we have this uh, enzymes in this so-called uh, electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation that use the oxygen. What nature has done is create a way that we can take advantage of the chemical properties of elements in nature in our body to obtain energy for us. And in nature, the ultimate electron acceptor that is a sex electron from other chemicals is oxygen. That's why the process of removing electrons from a compound is referred to as oxidation. And we take advantage of that process uh, by having uh, mitochondria. And this is the biggest adaptation that we have to be able to live in our environment, uh, to be able to breathe air with oxygenated air and use that to produce energy. And uh, the, this process happens inside the mitochondria. And the enzyme that is responsible for receiving the oxygen that is transported in the blood, in your hemoglobin, receiving that oxygen, and then allowing that oxygen to capture electrons. Where does these electrons come? The food that we eat, the primary energetic purpose is to is to create electron donor molecules that are inside the mitochondria and when these uh, donors uh, give electrons that eventually go to oxygen this process is coupled with another chemical reaction that allows cells to add a phosphate to this compound that is well known, it's called adenosine triphosphate. So you add to the monophosphate, a phosphate becomes adenosine diphosphate, and you add another one. But why is that relevant? Why is that important? Because the chemical reactions that happen in living organisms are all catalyzed by biological catalysts that we refer to as enzymes. And remember, like in chemistry, you may have a, a bowl in chemistry and you put a number of reactants there, but nothing happens. And then you heat up the solution and then those reactants become a product. That's how all the energy is produced in the body, especially in the case of the brain that we use uh, oxygen. Uh, we don't have other alternative uh, ways to obtain energy. So when that phosphate is added to the ADP to form ATP, adenosine triphosphate, whenever a chemical reaction is needed to take place, the reactants will be there in place and you remove a phosphate. And when you remove that phosphate, it liberates heat. And this is what we call calorie. So the amount of food that we eat means the number of calories that we can potentially, that is how much heat can we produce to make a reaction happen. If heat doesn't uh, become available, the reaction doesn't take place. And that's how the body regulates uh, all of these uh, life relevant reactions that, that are called energy metabolism by mon monitoring this. Uh, so that's why ATP is an energy molecule because uh, when you, br because it stores the potential that when you break it out, it releases uh, heat and then a reaction takes place. And uh, so ways that you can improve that process are the ways that should be used to try to approach this. So what, what I refer to as mitochondrial respiration. Now that's why I was so excited to talk to you. 
because we needed to get through all this background so that you can talk about mitochondrial respiration. You're, you are just a world class expert in this area. And the enzyme that helps control it is the cytochrome oxidase. And you have some ways to intervene in this process that just the everyday person like I might need to know about that will help bring oxygen more readily to that process and help my mitochondria. Let me tell you the, the way I got uh, motivated to, to pursue that line was uh, by the end of the 1990s, uh, we started uh, studying the brains of people that died uh, with diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, especially people that were in old age. And uh, we published a study in uh, 2001 that summarized our findings. In order to do that study, because we needed fresh uh, brains shortly after death to be able to have the chemicals there still uh, in good shape, we had to go to uh, Sun City. We did this in Sun City, Arizona, where older people live a retirement community, they have a, 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 a healthcare system and they all are very conscientious of having uh, donated their brains. Not only the, the people who are experiencing dementia, uh, but also their loved ones uh, that did not experience dementia, they donate their brains. So we were there uh, for long periods and started uh, whenever somebody will uh, die, uh, the pathologist uh, will certify the death and then will remove the brain. And uh, I will dissect the brain into pieces. Some pieces will stay there in the research institute and then the, the others will be frozen so that at the end we'll send all of them to my lab and when we analyze these uh, people, especially uh, we have really good control. Some of them were spouses of people that had Alzheimer's disease, that they share the same household, very similar environment. And uh, we match all of these uh, controls and Alzheimer's brain. And the most remarkable difference was in cytochrome oxidase. This cytochrome oxidase uh, was inhibited. So this literally the brains could not use oxygen to produce energy. And there was absolutely no relationship between the degree of dementia or the progression of the dementia with other things like amyloid uh, that were believed to be the causes of uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's side. So it was very clear that it was a more fundamental process, the inability of your brain to be able to use oxygen on top of the fact that everybody has we get older, it is more difficult to transport the oxygen to, to the tissues, especially the brain. But on top of that, then you have the enzyme that then can use the oxygen to generate energy that was down-regulated. And there was enough enzyme there it's just that them, that enzyme was not working properly. It, we call it, it was inhibited. And uh, the, this is what led me after this finding, it's uh, one of my most highly cited study and very difficult to reproduce because uh, we have very short time intervals uh, from the fresh uh, material to doing the freezing that I decided to find a way how can we then stimulate this enzyme how can we interfere with this process that that seems to be the most uh, relevant biochemical process that is happening and not these other uh, so-called biomarkers of disease uh, this is something that is happening in everybody as we go older so it's not unique to the Alzheimer's cases, but in the Alzheimer's uh, uh, brains, it was much greater than all the people that had the same age. And, uh, and from there on, uh, for years, uh, we started finding ways, and I found uh, 
in my lab, I tested two ways that uh, were successful at this. Uh, one of them was uh, methylene blue that you uh, probably have heard about this. Uh, so methylene blue uh, acted uh, in very low concentrations. When it gets into your body, it starts accumulating inside the mitochondria. And in a very, very low concentrations, then it becomes what is called a redox uh, cycle. It exchanges electrons uh, with its surrounding. So the part of our cells where there is more electron exchange is the, in the electron transport. So it uh, then becomes in equilibrium between what we call oxidize and reduce and starts passing electrons to the electron transport. So it becomes an alternate route, not just through the regular electron donors that are from the food that you eat. And by doing this, it then accelerates oxygen consumption and energy production. And uh, we tested this in animals uh, first. And yeah, in the- This is exciting. So what you are saying is that the brains you're seeing from Alzheimer's patients, and even those without Alzheimer's as you age, you have an inhibition of the ability to take up that for, oxygen. For, for and, but for using energy purpose, the methylene blue. To, to produce energy. For energy. Mm -hmm. Using the methylene blue will, will give it a crutch, basically, and allow that process to happen. And then you won't have the problems that you're seeing in an aging in brain. animals uh, we were surprised uh, we uh, did a number of models where uh, you can induce uh, the degeneration neurodegeneration by interfering with that uh, electron transport and in the presence of methylene blue uh, we could prevent if we had the right uh, amount and treatment we could prevent entirely the neurodegeneration because methylene blue was acting as a bypass to still maintain oxygen consumption and energy production and then the cells uh, will not uh, be deprived and atrophy and die and now uh, we did this in the retina first because it was uh, easy to access in an animal uh, the retina and we found uh, that we could prevent the degeneration we use a retina uh, eye model that simulated the most common uh, cause of uh, blindness in younger people that had to do with interference with one of these uh, enzymes in the electron transport. And we reproduced the same problem and we could prevent uh, the degeneration from happening. And then uh, we did it in the brain. Uh, we did it in uh, brains that were Whoa. isolated. Uh, uh, tissues, uh, then we did in the entire uh, animal, and uh, we could document that we could prevent this. And not only if you use toxins that affect uh, this uh, mitochondrial respiration, but also if you, uh, for example, one, one of the latest experiments with animals we did, we ligate the carotid arteries to simulate that chronic uh, decrease in blood flow that happens as we grow older and then treat them with methylene blue and we show that we can prevent the degenerative changes that are happening in the animals that are, have the ligation but uh, only have the control solution, not the methylene blue uh, solution. That's how strong it is. So, Dr. Gonzalez Lima, this is a this is a big thing in this field to have discovered this. But why is the word not getting out? Why why doesn't well, everyone there know are about this? Factors unrelated to science that play a role. Number one, uh, in terms of methylene blue, the number one factor is is the oldest synthetic drug that exists in the world. The first one that was developed. We're talking about in 1876, it was synthesized and it started to be used in the 1890s as a first uh, 
synthetic medication. It is not possible to generate a patent to protect this. For example, when I uh, mentioned to you that we could prevent the blindness that most commonly happens in young people by using the methylene blue, I gave presentations to a pharmaceutical company that works on this area and they saw the data, they, they saw that we could prevent this uh, in the animals. I also have uh, one of my former uh, PhD students in neuroscience was part of their team. And uh, but then the first question was, so uh, can we protect this technology? In other words, can we make a patent so that we can make profit? Otherwise, if we develop this and then somebody else can use it, and that was it. The pharmaceutical company didn't proceed with something that in this case was, you know, going to save the, make people be able to see, <laughs> uh, prevent the, the generation. Uh, and uh, for, that, for that reason alone, and this is what happens uh, with, with the pharmaceutical industry, they would just not use a chemical that somebody else can can produce and they won't get the go ahead and uh, mm -hmm. and we try i mean we try the the world uh, health organization has uh, declared methylene blue as one of the is in the list of their 100 uh, most needed medications in the world is listed there uh, yet uh, is no use for these purposes because no pharmaceutical company is actually manufacturing it uh, because they're afraid they will not uh, make enough profits. So every, every uh, emergency room in the US and Canada and many other countries has uh, methylene blue. It is the only antidote for metabolic poisons when you have difficulty transporting oxygen in blood or you consume or are exposed to a poison that affects mitochondrial respiration. For example, the most common poison uh, historically is like cyanide. What does cyanide does? Why do we die when we uh, ingest cyanide? It inhibits cytochrome oxidase activity. That's what cyanide does and has soon to have happen because the brain doesn't store energy to any significant degree. So as soon as you stop this process, like you unplug the brain from its source of energy and it shuts down and then you die. So the most common historical toxin, cyanide, operates on the same enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, that is the one that is slowly being affected as we grow old. So it, it is, this, however, the methylene blue is only used as an acute antidote in cases where you have transport. For example, if you uh, inhale uh, carbon monoxide uh, and this in, interferes with oxygen being transported in your blood, then the, the only thing they can do is uh, give you uh, methylene blue. There are other uh, things that do not work so well. So anything that affects uh, oxygen consumption, this metabolic uh, poisoning, the only antidote is methylene blue. But we're saying let's not just use it in this acute fashion because this is a process that is ongoing as we grow older, this uh, mitochondrial deterioration of uh, energy production and respiration. So at very low concentrations, it can become a way to facilitate that process to prevent that decay from happening. And that's where uh, we don't have it uh, as a tool. It also, it is also possible to use it in the other acute situations. For example, uh, stroke. In a stroke where you compromise blood supply to some part of your brain or globally, methylene blue can also uh, be beneficial. 
it uh, however is no use uh, and and I have tried to convince the emergency uh, doctors uh, they have it is there they have a protocol to use it is an FDA grandfather drug in other words uh, is a drug that was in existence before there was any FDA so it was grandfathered so there is no uh, problem with uh, using it and in many countries in the world it's uh, available over the counter and that's that's what i was wondering so if we want to to unpack this if someone says okay when should i be starting taking methylene blue in your opinion to help prevent cognitive decline how much should they take where can they get it what's it going to cost what are some of just the nitty gritty stuff the main problem uh, with methylene blue is that you excrete it from your body half about half of it uh, goes away between 12 and 14 hours after you take it uh, so it concentrates in your bladder and then you excrete it in the urine and as soon as uh, that urine comes out and it's uh, in contact with the air uh, methylene blue when it's in contact with the air it becomes oxidized and it becomes blue well, actually when it's inside the body is clear <laughs> uh, in its reduced form yes you put okay. methylene blue in a bottle you put it there uh, you put for example vitamin c ascorbic acid it reduces it, it becomes clear i let air go in check it and it becomes blue again uh, it's that magical change that would freak people out if their pee turns blue mm -hmm. <laughs> yes that's uh, the major uh, problem uh, really is uh, that they have that discomfort and uh, be if you use very low doses that still will happen so if you are wanting to pursue taking methylene blue um, what's the dose how often do you take that dose according to our animal studies and we did also uh, we did the first uh, human studies uh, demonstrating that methylene blue could improve uh, memory in humans in a placebo control randomized uh, clinical trial and the first thought is uh, mapping uh, the, the improve in cerebral blood flow uh, using fMRI in uh, humans uh, in people and uh, in based on all of these studies in both animals and humans uh, we see that we can get the same benefits using very low doses uh, so as long as this is cycling happens inside mitochondria so between half a milligram and one milligram per kilogram of body weight the usual average person uh, standard for pharmacology is like 70 kilograms so uh, it will be then between uh, you know up to 70 milligrams okay okay the in the u.s uh, for decades uh, methylene blue was available over the counter uh, in pills that were 65 milligram pills which actually were the the ones that we use in our first uh, human studies and these pills were used for uh, treating chronic urinary bladder infection because when methylene blue is excreted it starts building up inside the bladder first it goes to these tissues but then it starts uh, going your body starts excreting it and it starts building up in the bladder and the bladder it reaches a high concentration and when methylene blue is in high concentrations there it works opposite to what it works during the low concentration instead of uh, donated electrons for example to electron transport now it grabs uh, electrons from substances and remember grabbing electrons is oxidizing it becomes an pro-oxidant and then it kills bacteria and viruses uh, because of this uh, 
oxidative damage that it produces inside your bladder. Of course, it is only in the inside of your bladder because you already excreted it from your bladder and other tissues. So it, it works uh, that way. And by doing that, uh, they could uh, resolve this problem. Nowadays, uh, then physicians stop uh, using it and they instead uh, given rounds of antibiotics and especially older women have a high incidence of recurrent uh, urinary bladder infections and they have to go through these rounds of uh, debilitating rounds of antibiotics every time and then it happens again and uh, my, my own mother was one of them and I put her on uh, methylene blue so if you have a problem like that uh, recurring urinary tract infections that's the time <laughs> to start uh, methylene blue for sure so do you take methylene blue personally to help um, your mitochondria? Yes, uh, I do. I took it uh, this morning. And uh, I, uh, but normally I only do it uh, when uh, what I refer to as a mm. challenge. Uh, that is, if I have a challenge of an infection coming up or uh, stress, fatigue, then I start taking it. There is nothing that I have uh, recommended to anybody that I don't take myself mm -hmm. uh, first, be, even before I do it, any study with anybody. And actually, not only me, but uh, members of my family who volunteer uh, are also the next <laughs> ones. So after I've done it with the animals, I've done it with myself and my family members, including my, my wife and sons, uh, then I am confident. Mm -hmm that I can use this in a ex control experiment with humans uh, and, uh, and, and monitor exactly what it's doing. And I remember uh, when I did it with myself for, for some time, I will fill up a refrigerator in my lab with all my samples, monitoring how the body, uh, but this is also beneficial because each one of us in uh, gets rid of uh, drugs in a different way. But the fact that methylene blue stains your urine uh, blue, it has this discoloration. It can be also green because the urine is more concentrated, it's yellow. With the blue, it becomes green. Uh, this tells you how often you can take it. Because if you take a small amount, and you continue to urinate blue, that means there is methylene blue is still in your body and you're still excreting it. So you don't have to take it again until your urine is clear. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, so you can uh, individualize this to each person. How often should you take it? Well, as long as it is in your system, you don't have to take it again. So this, this community here listening to this podcast is especially concerned about preventing cognitive decline. So what should, what do you want to tell them? Is this something that should be a challenge to them every once in a while, take methylene blue? Is this something they should watch their pee and make sure that it's kind of blue and when it's not, they should take another dose? Is this an ongoing thing they should consider or is this something that is, doesn't have an application to prevent cognitive decline? I, th I think it will uh, have an application if used like you indicated. That I think that's the best way to use it because it's not a fixed dose for every individual. Uh, you can titrate the dose based on how, how well you excreted. it. As we grow older, we have more difficulty uh, excreting the drugs, which is one of the big problems with older people taking medication that the levels are really higher than uh, with the younger people. So especially if you have difficulty with uh, ur urinary uh, issues, then you're going to slow down. So you that way you prevent your levels of methylene blue ever going up because you know when you're taking it that you already have cleared. Uh, however, that shouldn't be the only thing that you do uh, there because... Uh, the methylene blue is not going to open up uh, your yeah. arteries yeah. to go to your brain. Uh, so you're going to have to deal with uh, the health of your cardiovascular system. Uh, 
the methylene blue will not make you thinner, uh, lose excess uh, body fat. Uh, that you're going to have to do through uh, proper nutrition that takes into account the amount of expenditure of energy that you have now and the intake that you have and any other condition that may be contributing to the obesity. So it cannot be done in isolation. If you can think of uh, a sphere of uh, brain health, uh, you're gonna, you can have pharmacological things like methyl and blue that are just improving, they're just improving a process that you're normally doing. So methyl and blue is not doing something different than what your body, your body is already doing. It's just adding another source of electrons to that system that is in place. And, uh, but then you have to have the cognitive challenge. It's like if you put a fertilizer in the ground, but you don't plant anything <laughs> and you don't water it, uh, it it's not going to help. Uh, so methylene blue, in fact, in, in animal studies and humans, uh, we show that if you evoke an activity in some part of the brain because you challenge that part of the brain in a task, and methylene blue is on board, that part of the brain benefits more because it's the part of the brain that is demanding more energy use. So if you just take methylene blue and stay in baseline, well, methylene blue is not adding to your energy resources. But if you have methylene blue and then uh, have a demand from a task, for example, a cognitive task, uh, then methylene blue can increase your energy availability, and then you can perform better the task. And that's how it is happening in the brain. Now, your research has also shown that, that a near-infrared light shown on a special part of the forehead can go through the skin, through the skull, be able to get, is that the prefrontal cortex, and be able to also yeah, the prefrontal. turn on this cytochrome mm. oxidase in in that mm -hmm. manner. So could you share with us yeah. what your research is finding about near infrared light? Please. Yes, uh, with the near infrared light, uh, we're more limited. With the methylene blue wing, it goes where it's needed. Mm -hmm. You know, the more uh, energy demand you have in some brain area because you're working the, that area, methylene blue will go there and will facilitate. Uh, with the light, uh, we're focusing on the forehead for two reasons. Uh, the number one is a practical reason because the hair, especially the dark hair, absorbs the light and doesn't let the light go through. Uh, red to near infrared light can go through our tissues. So, for example, if you put a flashlight inside your mouth, uh, you see red uh, in your cheeks because mm -hmm. the red wavelengths are able to come out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and the, yes, they, they can go through, and the near infrared even uh, can go deeper. And we optimize that as one of the things we've done in uh, recent years for the past uh, uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, we have been perfecting uh, using near infrared light. Uh, in humans, uh, doing animal studies in parallel with the human study. And we were the first one to do a control study, uh, showing with proper uh, placebo sham randomized that you could in fact improve sustained attention, uh, short-term memory functions that are based on the prefrontal cortex by uh, stimulating with this uh, near infrared light. And uh, so, the hair we try to avoid. There are some people that sell devices that cover all your head and things like that. In our hands, that light doesn't get through uh, okay. when you have that situation. So, so we focus here. But since this is the first, the prefrontal base functions are the ones that have to do with this uh, short-term uh, memory issues that we start experiencing first as uh, we grow older. And not only that, when we grow older as a natural cognitive aging, we try to compensate for whatever deficits are happening in other parts of the brain by recruiting our prefrontal cortex. Hmm. 
In other words, our executive part of the brain is recruited. If other is like if you have a, a, a team or a company and the others one are not doing their job, but well, now the supervisor <laughs> is sort of taking over and doing that uh, job for them. So this is one of the most important compensations or compensatory mechanisms that we have when we grow older. We start using, this is our biggest part of the brain, our biggest piece of the cerebral cortex, the prefrontal cortex. And it's the executive, it's the boss, so he can talk to all of these other parts of the brain. And then we can engage that prefrontal cortex, facilitate the energy there. It's as if you think that you're giving resources to the boss, to the executive. And then the executive is uh, managing those resources uh, to facilitate the rest of the brain. You don't have to give it to every part of the brain. Just like you don't have to give it to every member of the team, just give it to the executive and then he will orchestrate the networks uh, with the rest of the team. Now, you have a special laser that you use for this, right? And I can't just go buy that laser. That wouldn't be a good idea, would it? Have you have you made something for the general public to be able? Right now, yes, you can buy the laser, but it's uh, designed for uh, being used for research purposes or in clinics. Mm. And uh, but uh, what we are trying to see whether we can develop a, another way that will be available to people that they can use at home. There are other uh, groups that have developed such things. The only problem is that most often than not, uh, they don't have the supporting scientific evidence that uh, what they develop actually works. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been taking longer to do this because we want to make sure that whatever we develop uh, is going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and many of these other groups are just citing uh, our work and other people's work uh, to to claim, I mean, as a base for their claims. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you know, nowadays there are companies in other parts of the world that are gonna start building whatever you, <laughs> they're gonna imitate and build uh, whatever comes device comes out there. Uh, and, uh, and we don't know about the quality and what actually those devices are doing. So I'm hoping that this will work, but, but uh, we, we don't know. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, with respect to the near infrared light, uh, we can develop a, a, a practical way mm -hmm. that this can be used for people. Mm -hmm. What's your timeline, doctor, for getting that out maybe? I wanted to have the prototype uh, ready for this summer. Wow. And I have uh, an electrical engineer working on it. I have to admit that there have been problems with what they call the uh, supply chain mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for parts uh, for uh, and uh, we have been set back uh, months uh, because of this uh, it should have been done by now uh, from uh, if we had all the pieces and uh, we also had to wait for technology a little bit to create uh, an LED that was efficient enough uh, that could simulate closely uh, as close as possible, it cannot be exactly the same as what a laser, what our uh, lab laser does. Mm -hmm. Before we go, mm -hmm. there are two things uh, that I wanted to mention that I haven't mentioned before in other uh, presentations, yes. because I focus on the methylene blue, the photobiomodulation, but you can also work on nutrition right now, immediately. And there are two things that I that can ben, can prevent your cognitive decline as you get older. One of the uh, uh, one of them is a medium chain triglycerides (MCT). Medium chain triglycerides. Let me tell you why they work, and they have uh, already been approved by the FDA in what they refer to as a medical food, a medical food for the management of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And the reason they have approved is that the evidence is there. They help. What happens? As our brain grows older, 
we our cells that transport the glucose inside the neurons that glucose transport becomes impaired so as we grow older even if we uh, consume lots of carbohydrates lots of sugars we cannot get it to our brain cells to use in fact this is one of the reasons that people keep looking for sweets and keep overeating because uh, their brain is telling them the brain is telling them i'm not getting the glucose i need to create those electron donors uh, and uh, so you keep eating and when when your sugar levels are high your insulin keeps coming out and comes out chronically chronically until your receptor for insulin become damaged and then you get uh, insulin resistant and diabetes type 2 so all of this part of the so-called metabolic syndrome so the reason that is happening as we grow older is that we can no longer efficiently take glucose we still can take but not enough mm -hmm. uh, and this was first discovered not uh, many years ago in animals and it, it was then uh, demonstrated in humans and then it was demonstrated in individuals labeled with alzheimer's disease it was even the worst case scenario that they had difficulty taking up glucose transporting it inside the neurons so what can you do our body still retains an alternate source of energy not the primary one but one that we use physiologically when we were babies when we because we're mammals uh, breastfeeding is primarily a source of fats and the in at that period when we are babies breastfeeding we still have a very active uh, energy needs so and every time we also go uh, go uh, for about 14 to 16 hours without eating we go in a fasting mode our body when there's no more uh, sugar available in our blood uh, our body starts shifting to this other mode this uh, mode that uses uh, triglycerides medium chain triglycerides in particular has a source of energy and it is not the same as direct as other sources you have to go through the liver the liver has to break it down into a compound that then can be used as a substitute for glucose by our brain this is these are called ketone bodies this process is called ketosis uh, so keto genic diets will produce this effect but you can also you don't have to uh, do the fasting or uh, entirely use a ketogenic diet you can supplement your diet with these uh, medium chain triglycerides mm -hmm. and the studies have uh, even show benefit in people who are already demented because they have that alternate uh, source of energy and then they can perform better and the the good thing is that yes you can buy the prescription medical food at a very high price and the reason is uh, because they they made it a semi-synthetic compound but you can have the same natural medium chain triglycerides uh, you can buy in your supermarket uh, over the counter and they will have exactly the same benefit and it takes about uh, depending on your body size between three and four tablespoons a day uh, you probably have may have heard about uh, coconut oil mm -hmm. the the ingredients in coconut oil that have the benefit are these medium chain triglycerides so it's a it's a preferable to already buy the medium chain triglycerides it's only about 60 to 67 percent um, medium chain triglycerides in regular coconut oil it's not a fixed amount because a natural product but you can buy the medium chain tri triglycerides uh, that are already uh, separated out and you can add it to any food that you eat uh, as long as you take uh, remember think of this as a food because you need to take enough to produce uh, an alternate source of energy so that's uh, number one and it's already being used for dementia 
uh, and it's FDA approved, but you can get it over the counter. And the other one uh, is a, a compound that is also acts, again, similarly, it has to facilitate energy metabolism in another way. And this is called acetyl l carnitine uh, Sometimes athletes uh, take this compound uh, because muscle also uses lots of energy. L-carnitine has some of the effects, but the acetyl L-carnitine is a better uh, com is a better compound to do this. Again, you can buy this uh, over the counter. It is a nutritional supplement. It is essentially derived from an amino acid and. Uh, the, what is the advantage? This acts as a precursor in the chain of events that lead to the electron transport and the energy production. So you're adding a, a precursor molecule to facilitate that process. And that can be taken between 500. The studies that have been done uh, especially works well with uh, older people, uh, not with demented people because you still have to have enough machinery working properly for this precursor to uh, make an advantage. So they, all the way from uh, one a gram a day to four grams a day, it has uh, been done in uh, clinical trials uh, with success. And I recommend starting out with one gram a day. You can buy the pills uh, at uh, many supermarkets. And, uh, it is used uh, very heavily in Europe. Uh, the Italians are the ones who've done most of the work uh, on this. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, again, the pharmaceutical companies are not interested because it's easily available. Any any company can manufacture uh, these if they wanted to. So those are two nutritional uh, approaches that you can use right now. You have shared so many wonderful can-do pearls with us. Thank you so much. Is there anything Thank else you. you are doing in your daily re uh, regimen that you haven't touched on to help keep your your brain vibrant as you age? I try. Uh, I usually do. Uh, this morning I went swimming with my wife. Uh, uh, so uh, swimming, it's a wonderful thing. If you cannot swim well, I recommend also aquaerobics. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, will produce an aerobic exercise benefit. Will not you will not be injured in any way. Some people are still running, jogging, and this uh, older age is not a really good idea. Uh, the stress that you put in your joints and your bones. Uh, but uh, swimming is wonderful, and uh, aquaerobics also. So that's uh, one thing that we we'll recommend for aerobic exercise. Uh, and uh, I also uh, enjoy uh, walks in the nature uh, every day uh, with my dog, my loyal companion. And uh, so I think the, the benefit of those walks uh, in, in contact with nature, breathing more oxygenated air, and also sharing that uh, with your pet uh, is a, it's a wonderful experience uh, to add to your life. Uh, and keep learning. As a scientist, uh, that's uh, my job is to learn and share the information and discover new information. So the more you learn, uh, the more active your brain is going to be. And naturally, that enzyme that we talk about, cytochrome oxidase, it will upregulate if you demand more energy from your brain through the process of learning. Exercising your learning and memory uh, will make your brain put on board more cytochrome oxidase. It's a, it's a natural process. And the opposite is also true if you don't do that. Uh, you downregulate your levels of cytochrome oxidase, and then you're less likely to have uh, energy when you need it. So those are uh, recommendations that I, I do every day. I have a, a, a list of papers uh, that are waiting for me to, to start uh, reading and studying and discussing that uh, with my uh, graduate students and postdocs. 
And uh, and now lately, my life, I'm doing what I'm doing uh, with you here. I'm trying to share this uh, with a larger uh, audience. I am so grateful because oftentimes these things, these things do not get out from the scientists' mm -hmm. uh, uh, work uh, to the practitioners uh, soon enough. Dr. Gonzalez Lima, thank you for your time. You've given so much of it. I look forward to, to keeping track of your research in the years ahead. Very much so. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. It's important to mention that if you're going to pursue getting methylene blue, make sure it is USP grade, or another name for that is pharmaceutical grade. Dr. Gonzalez Lima says you don't want to put in your body the two lower forms, which are the chemical or the industrial grades. Also, he's working on developing an LED light that will replicate what he's done in his research with the near-infrared laser to stimulate cytochrome oxidase. A laser like his, he believes in the hands of the general public, might not be a good idea. So stay tuned for the development on that. You've been listening to the Cutting Edge Health Podcast, created and hosted by Jane Rogers. The website is cuttingedgehealth.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and would very much appreciate your writing a review. They help a lot and we read each one. Any information shared on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Guest opinions are their own. This podcast is not responsible for the veracity of their statements. The comments expressed are not medical advice. Do not use any of this information without first talking to your doctor. This podcast and Jane Rogers disclaim responsibility for any adverse effects from the use of any information presented. Thank you for listening and have a beautiful day.